Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down Ice Cream Man Volumes 3 and 4, which spans issues 9 through 16 of this series. Now, this is a very weird, creepy, bizarre book. I don't think it's for everybody. There's some people that will not be into this. But for those of you who are into it, I'm glad you're here so we can go through this together. Um, sometimes, even myself, I don't love certain issues of Ice Cream Man because they're just so weird and unsettling and random. But either way, I think it's really interesting to go through to see where the story is going and the ways they are telling the story to us as it is so unique and different. So I thought it would be worth going through more of this series. So I hope you all enjoy this. Uh, we are going to see Rick, the ice cream man, and Caleb, the man in black, and their eternal struggle. We're going to learn more of their lore. We're going to see them in these like alternate universes or something. And we're also going to have a whole bunch of creepy one-off stories as well, following individual people. So uh, let's dive into it now. Let's dive into the weirdness of Ice Cream Man Volumes 3 and 4. Ice Cream Man Volume 3, Hopscotch Melange. Written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Martin Morazzo, and colors by Chris O'Halloran. Issue 9, Part 1, Western Story. Caleb, the man in black, is in the desert in what looks like the American Southwest. Only, it's not the West. Caleb is riding a horse and has a pet dog with him, and they are hunting a gigantic spider, like monster-sized spider, something that should not exist in the real world. Caleb himself doesn't look fully human. His eyes are fully black, and he has pointy ears. In past issues of Ice Cream Man, Caleb did look human, so that leaves me to believe that this is another universe or something. Caleb, he uses his lasso and ropes up a giant spider, and then he orders his dog to bite into the spider. And the dog does so. It takes a big old bite out of the spider and appears to kill it. Caleb, he then removes an eye out of the spider and feeds it to his dog. Caleb. He travels on and goes to his uncle's house. Caleb refers to his uncle as Old Man. Caleb's uncle, Old Man, hugs him, and the two of them head inside the home. The uncle says to Caleb that Caleb's cousin will be here soon. Caleb talks to his uncle about Rick, the ice cream man. He says to his uncle that our magic is sacred. It's made of fragile life stuff, but Ricardus, he just goes off and conjures these aberrations. The old man tells Caleb that everything is one thing. Each bastard of creation is a reflection of something true. Caleb's cousin then arrives. It is in fact Rick, the ice cream man. So Caleb and Rick are related. Caleb and Rick and their uncle all have pointy ears in this world with weird black eyes. Rick, he comments, Caleb, uncle, sorry I'm late, guess I lost track of time. The old man invites Rick in. He tells his nephews that they have business to discuss. The old man pulls out a big old book, and the old man says that this universe is on its last leg. The plants take root and speak to the dirt, the dirt in turn speaks back, and it's saying, get out, quick. Rick asks why. He likes it here. My buggies feed on the bird things. The old man tells Rick, what you like ain't important, kid. Time's up, and the two of you gotta go. In this here book is the rules for the next place, and the rules got but one rule. You follow them. Do I make myself plain? Caleb asks his uncle if He's coming too to the next world? The uncle says, I'm gonna be delayed. Your mother's asked me to look after y'all, so that's what I intend to do. Now get, before I turn grumpier than I am already. As Caleb and Rick go to leave, the uncle asks to have a word with Rick alone. So Caleb, he goes on and he plays fetch with his dog and he starts a campfire and he goes to sleep for the night. And while he was sleeping, Rick apparently played some music to attract the dog over to him. And when Caleb woke up in the morning, he went to go look for his dog. 
and Caleb, he's calling out for his dog, but then we see that Rick has killed the dog and is wearing the dog like a coat. Rick says it was getting cold, but now I'm all toasty and warm. Caleb asks, what did you do to my goddamn dog? And Rick answers, I did what the geezer told me. He showed me the book, Caleb, the rules, and the rules say, kick up dust. Be the bug crawling beneath the surface. All worlds are covered in bugs. Some are just bigger than others. You'll see, like old man did. Caleb, he rushes off on his horse back to his uncle's house. When Caleb arrives, a giant spider appears to have stabbed one of its arms through the old man. Caleb lassos the spider's arm and shoots a bow and arrow in the face of the spider and eventually kills it. Caleb, he then talks to his dying uncle, and his uncle, with his dying breath, tells Caleb, On to the next one, Caleb. Everything is one thing. A narration box then reads, Everything is one thing. The plants take root and speak to the dirt. The dirt in turn speaks back, and it's saying, Go! And so we do, meeting someday at the place where all paths come to a single point. Caleb, then talking to himself after burying his uncle, says, See ya in the next one, Rick. Alright, so how do we interpret this issue? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it means. But this is probably one of the most lore-heavy issues of Ice Cream Man we've had. Although it doesn't really fully make sense. It does appear that Caleb and Rick are locked into some sort of eternal struggle that spans time in universes, and in this particular issue they seem to be in another universe which they now seem to be abandoning for the next one. For the rest of this volume, it seems like we are going to be jumping to different times and places, and in some cases different universes as well. Issue 10, Hopscotch Melange, Part 2 border story. The first seven pages in this issue are entirely in Spanish, and a note in the beginning reads, Need help with the Spanish? Google Translate works like a charm. Which is honestly kind of annoying as someone that does not know Spanish. You don't really know what is being said unless you want to manually translate it, so you kind of have to infer what is being said based on the images and drawings. Luckily, though, in the trade paperback, they actually published the translation so you could reference it in the bonus material. So, this issue takes place in Mexico in 1919. A girl named Maria is having a quinceañera, which is a celebration when a young woman is turning 15. Maria seems to be promised to this evil general who appears to be like a Mexican version of Rick the Ice Cream Man. And the General seems to have bad intentions toward her, and he is supposed to marry her. He calls her a trophy, in a way, and tells her to enjoy these last days, little one. These celebrations will be scarce when we are married. That's what you want to hear when you're getting married. <laughs> Later that day, Maria's lover, a cowboy named John, secretly comes to meet her. John gives Maria a rose. Maria is sad because the general treats her like a toy. John tells her, Hey, don't you worry about him. Tomorrow night, I'll be back to take you away from here. He promises. The both of them say that they love each other. Maria, she then has her big quinceañera birthday party, and she looks at the general across the table from her, and she dreads what her possible future might be like with him. In El Paso, Texas, John is gathering supplies and he is grabbing his gun. He is getting ready to face off against the General and steal away Maria to America so they can be together. Caleb, the man in black, he seems to be there. He seems to know John. Caleb tries to talk some sense into John. He asks him, so you're going to whisk her away to the United States so she can live the impoverished life of a cowboy's maiden? John argues back, Hey, it's better than a life with the general. Caleb tells John, says you. There's rules to this world, kid. Lines in place. Certain ones you cross, you never come back. John angry tells Caleb, 
And what do you know? You're just a rusted up cowboy with no one to talk to but me. Caleb, he then sneaks off to Mexico to Maria. He is outside her bedroom at night. He calls out to her and tells her to come down and that they don't have much time. As John waits for Maria, the general walks out with her and he has a knife to her throat. The general says to John, Hello, cowboy. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. How long I've waited to see with my own eyes Maria's American paramour. John calls out to the general to let her go. The general replies, Ah, yes, empty canned bravado. You puff your chest and pretend you are not but a lost child. How trite. John, he threatens to shoot the general. And the general says, I am an idea. You cannot kill an idea with a bullet. John replies, let's see about that. And he shoots the general in the shoulder. And Maria, she then kicks the general in the head. The general, though, he gets up and he slaps Maria. And then he tells John, You will die in this country, little boy. Far from home, alone, at my feet. Like so many before you, and so many after. The general now resembles Rick in his demonic form with sharp teeth that we've seen before. The general stabs John in his lower back. And John goes down, and he starts slowly dying from the blood loss. The general tells Maria, Be with him, if you please. And then he walks away. Over in America, in El Paso, Texas, Caleb, the man in black, he is still there. And eventually, even though John has died, Maria shows up at Caleb's door, where John would have eventually taken her. Maria tells Caleb, I'm sorry, I had nowhere else to go. That is the end of this issue, and we assume that Caleb took Maria in, and he continued his battle and struggles against Rick. Issue 11, Hopscotch Melange, Part 3, TV Story. This issue is about a man trapped in random, messed up reality TV shows. It is a reality TV show nightmare fever dream. So we see this guy, Will Parsons. He is the innocent civilian in this story. He is in a TV show called Mannequin House, which is a parody of The Bachelor. And Rick, the ice cream man, is the host. And all of the other contestants are mannequins. Rick tells Will and the other mannequins, Gentlemen, this is Stephanie's final rose of the night. If you don't receive one, I'm sorry, but you'll have to be taken away for improvement. Will, listening to this, asks, What does improvement mean? The mannequin, Stephanie, chooses someone else, not Will. And Will, since he is rejected, is dragged away for improvement. In the confessional, Stephanie says why she didn't pick Will. She says, Listen, I'm not a shallow person. I like have depth and stuff, but... I'm here to find love, you know, and Will, I got the feeling like he didn't want to be here. He'd say things like, please, I don't want to be here. And it's like, stop sending mixed messages, guy. Say what you mean. Anyway, I couldn't get past his face. All of those features. Will is being dragged away by some mannequins to the room for improvement, but he manages to escape their grasp and he runs through an exit door. And all of a sudden, when he exits that exit door, he is on another TV show. And this one is called Family Autopsy. A dead man is on a slab on the set of this game show. And the host announces, Mr. Will Parson, let's prep him for surgery, boys. You know the rules. Some dogs dressed as surgeons dress Will in a surgical gown. The host then tells Will, You've got 30 minutes to figure out what killed your surprise family member, your favorite Uncle Bob. Will, he's confused. He says, Uncle Bob's dead? When did this happen? Will is then forced to try and dissect his uncle and figure out the cause of his uncle's death. In a confessional, Will says to the camera, I should have called my uncle more. I just get so busy. I mean, I could have texted him a text. It's such a simple thing, and I'm on my phone all the time. 
And then Uncle Bob, who was supposed to be dead, is somehow alive now and talking in the confessional. Bob says, wait, I'm dead? Was it the cigarettes that did it? And then Bob somehow sees his nephew and says, Willie, is that you? Will, he says that he can't figure out what killed his uncle. And he refuses to cut into his uncle's dead body. And the audience of apparently skeletons and mannequins are all booing Will. And they are yelling, autopsy him, you weenie. Will, he then storms off saying, I'm sorry. And now Will is on a new game show. And this one is called Chopped. And the host tells the contestants, create something resembling a person from the person parts in your mystery baskets. The contestants on this show are a mannequin, Will, a dog, and a zombie. The host tells the contestants the mystery parts that they have are a foot, another foot, Uncle Bob's teeth, and a farmer's market kale. So I guess they have to assemble a body from these parts. Will, he refuses to do this. He says to everyone, I'm not doing it, you hear me? I'm done. I'm walking right out of this nightmare and no one is going to stop me. Will, he walks out and he walks right into another show called America's Got Intestines, which is a parody of America's Got Talent, except it's about your exposed intestines. <laughs> the judges are three different versions of Rick the Ice Cream Man we've seen over various issues of this book. One of the Ricks says, I've been doing this for a long time, and I gotta say, those are some of the worst intestines I've ever seen. Will, he looks down at his body, and his intestines are spilling out all over the place. Will, he's so confused, and the various Ricks slam their buzzers, and a trapdoor opens, and Will falls through it. Where is Will now? Will is now in a basement where it looks like he is with Joel from way back in issue 4. Will asks, where the hell is he? Joel explains the various names for this place. He says, you're in the sweet place, the room for improvement, the ice cream shop. But what it's called isn't important. What matters is what it is. It's a food pantry. They ate my arm, and they called it brunch. So I guess they are being stored in a food pantry to be eaten later by other people. Will asks, who is they? And Joel answers, the upstairs people. And who are the upstairs people? Well, they are members of another reality TV show called Wealthy Family of Zombies. <laughs> and they are the ones that ate Joel's arm. And this Wealthy Family of Zombies is clearly some sort of disturbed Keeping Up with the Kardashians parody. One of the Kardashians says, I'm starving. And another one replies, oh my god, me too. And then they start bickering back and forth. You're always hungry, Carrie. Wait, are you calling me fat? Oh my god, you're such an effing drama queen. Wait, are you calling me a drama queen? And then we see their zombie confessionals. And the one zombie Kardashian says, all I said was that she's always hungry. And another one replies, people judge me, but what gives them the right? I'm always hungry too. I'm a zombie, just like everyone else. We're all zombies, right? You sit and you laugh and you call us names, but guess what? You're still watching 19 seasons and you can't look away. The zombie Kardashians eventually call out to one of their mannequins that's apparently their chef, and they ask him to bring them some more food. So the mannequin chef goes downstairs to the sweet place and he drags away Will for brunch. Will is screaming, but I don't want to be brunch. And Joel tells Will, no one ever does, Will. No one ever does. And Will, he is strapped to a table, and the zombie Kardashians all chow down on him. We now leave the zombie Kardashian wealthy family of zombie show, and we head over to somewhere else. We see Rick, the ice cream man, is at Will's home with the rest of Will's actual family sitting around for dinner. Rick, he is holding a camera, and he tells the rest of the family, Great, really great, guys. Let's take five and then shoot again from the other side so that Jerry's got plenty to work with in the editing booth. One of the girls asks, Hey, where's Will and Uncle Bob? And the final page says, Find out next week on Missing Parsons. 
and we see a picture of Will's family with him and his uncle Bob missing. So yet again, another reality TV show, except this one is a missing person true crime one. And then the TVs all turn off and they're ecstatic and we end the issue. Issue 12, Hopscotch Melange, Part 4, Space Story. An astronaut named Captain Noah Smith has been traveling for nearly three years aboard the Archival Recivilization capsule. He seems to be searching for a new inhabitable world to revive the human population on. On the spaceship, there is a mega hard drive that contains two images of every living thing that ever was. It will be used to help terraform whatever this new world is that he eventually might find. As Noah is working away, an alarm goes off, and Noah, he rushes to the piloting area, and he sees various space spiders destroying meteors in this meteor field. So Noah, he begins piloting the spaceship manually, trying to navigate around the spiders and the meteors. He successfully outmaneuvers the asteroid field, and then he puts the spaceship into autopilot as he then heads over to another part of the ship. Noah heads over to a place called the Memory Corridor. Noah narrates to us why the Earth died as he is in this corridor. The Earth died because of many things. Thing number one was global warming. Thing 452 was the split atom. Thing 679 was disease. There was also technological singularity. There was also bad television. Many reasons why the Earth didn't make it. Noah then looks at the memories of his family, his wife and kids. He misses them. They are all dead now. An alarm goes off. One of the space spiders apparently made its way into the engine room of the ship. Noah heads over there, and the space spider is trying to damage things. Noah shoots at it, and the spider closes in on him. It is going to bite into Noah, but Noah blasts the spider point blank in its mouth and then the spider flies off. Now the spider is gone, but it created a hole in the ship, and the ship needs to make an emergency crash landing on a nearby moon. The spaceship, it successfully lands, and Noah, he is looking at readings on his computer aboard the spaceship. The computer appears to detect a life form on the moon. Noah says out loud, my God, there's a human here. Noah assumes that it must be a human from a previous recivilization pond. Noah, he gets dressed in a spacesuit and he heads out onto this moon to explore. Noah, he is walking around and he finds some vegetation and flowers. And eventually, Noah is standing above a small chasm. The signal is getting stronger. The potential life form is apparently close. Noah, he trips and he falls, and he is tumbling to the bottom of this chasm. At the bottom of the chasm, he sees a picture of his family. How did this get here? Noah, he then sees Caleb, the man in black, in a black space outfit, floating towards Noah. Noah, thinking Caleb a threat, scrambles. He grabs a gun and he points it at Caleb, but then Caleb disappears. Noah, he walks on. We see the picture of his family now has all the family as skeletons except for Noah. Noah Smith, he continues walking in this chasm, trying to find the source of the signal. He then finds a small cave, and in the cave there are etchings on the wall. Inside the cave is Rick, the ice cream man. Rick is sitting on a chair, wearing barely any clothes, and the clothes he is wearing are all tattered, and Rick has alien eyes and pointy ears like he did back in issue 9. Rick tells Noah, Welcome, Captain Smith. You made it to the end of the road. Noah asks how Rick knew his name, and Rick replies, Honestly, I guessed. It was bound to be Smith or Bowman or Cooper or Ripley. Some meaningless string of consonants meant to give identity to space meat. Noah asks if Rick is the signal that he's been following. Rick, he points to three dead astronauts hanging on a wall. Rick says it must be one of them. 
The flesh fades, but their little gizmos whir on, beeping endlessly into the void, like tiny music from a truck. An old man once told me the truth about the universe. Do you want to hear it? The truth, Captain Smith, is that there is none. It's all a farce, a song with no key. You think pictures will bring your squirmy little species back to life? That's absurd. Your world is dead forever, Captain. But don't despair. These things happen sometimes. Noah says that Rick is wrong and that Rick is just a monster here floating on a space rock. Noah points a gun on Rick. Rick tells Noah, Do you know how many people have pointed a gun at me? Need I explain again the folly in trying to kill an idea? I'm a bad thought, Noah. I'm the voice in your head. Noah shoots at Rick. Rick is still fine, though. Rick says that he is going to take Noah's ship. Noah asks, But why me? These men all had ships. Rick answers, I don't need a ship. I need a map. So there must be something on Noah's ship that would work as a map for Rick to get to wherever he wants to get to. Noah, he starts running. He is trying to get back to his spaceship before Rick does. When he arrives, though, Rick is already waiting there, now looking human, and also dressed in his classic ice cream man outfit. Rick talks to the AI on board the spaceship and orders it to remove Noah's brain, and the AI, kind of like Hal in 2001 Space Odyssey, complies and kills Noah. Rick is now talking to himself, and he says, I bet we'll find a new universe in no time, fast as fast can be. Lickety split. Rick, he then takes off in Noah's spaceship. And we see Caleb is standing down there on the moon's surface, staring at Rick flying away. And Caleb says to himself, On to the next one, Rick. So it appears that Rick and Caleb's eternal struggle is crossing universes and they are on their way to another one. That is the end of Volume 3, but let's move along to Volume 4 now, Tiny Lives. Issue 13, Palindromes. A palindrome is a word or phrase or sequence that reads the same backward as well as forward. So this comic is designed in such a way that it can be read both backward and forward. An author's note reads, If you choose to enjoy the story backwards, read the panels from bottom to top and right to left. Alright, let's begin the story. Paul used to have a partner named Michael, who died of cancer three weeks ago. Paul goes outside. An ice cream truck is outside his house. And a sewer is open, and a sewer grate reads Underworld on it. Paul decides to go into the sewer, go into the underworld, and try and take up his partner's death with the supposed king of the underworld, and maybe get some answers. As Paul climbs down the initial ladder, he sees a little girl with no eyes and an owl on her shoulder. The little girl says, Damn it, I'm mad. Mr. Owl ate my metal worm. Stupid thing won't even hoot. And then the owl hoots. And then the little girl laughs maniacally. I have no idea what this means. Paul, he keeps climbing lower into the sewer. He goes down another ladder. He sees a homeless man named Dennis. Dennis tells Paul, Dennis, show you the way out and then in. Dennis sinned. Dennis stuck in the below place. Come, we go. Dennis is leading Paul through the sewer. And eventually Dennis shows Paul his friends. His friends are two cats that seem to be connected together, a dog in a straitjacket, a bird with a skeleton body, and some ice cream drippers. Paul, he continues deeper into the sewer, following Dennis. And then Paul goes on after Dennis, continuing further. He goes through a circular door with teeth bordering on it. And then he passes by a pit with monster arms and tongues and stuff shooting out of it. Then there is a red balloon. Paul holds on to the red balloon, and he floats downward. And then when he reaches the bottom, he sees a metal door, 
and on the metal door it says, Coming or Going, on it. Paul walks through that door, and then he is in some kind of throne room, and the throne is covered in blood, but it is empty. No one is home. Paul decides, well, the king of the underworld isn't here, he might as well leave. And Paul, he begins his journey back home. He goes back outside that door, he grabs the red balloon, and it floats him back up. He walks past the monster pit with the arms and tongues and stuff. Then he goes through the door with the teeth bordering on it. And then he reaches Dennis again, and he climbs up and Dennis follows him. Dennis and Paul walk by Dennis's weird friends again, the ice cream drippers, the bird skeleton, the dog in the straitjacket, and the connected cats. Paul then leaves Dennis and continues climbing up. He passes by the weird girl with no eyes and the owl on her shoulder. Paul, he then climbs out of the sewer and he goes back into his home. And he looks at the picture of his partner, Michael, again. And that is the end of the issue. So this was kind of a weird issue. I did not love the story in it. But I guess it is kind of cool to read the story both ways and kind of have them mirror each other. So it's a very unique gimmick, although not really a great story. Issue 14, Down and Across. There is a husband and a wife. The husband is named Earl Greengrove, and he loves doing crosswords. And his wife is named Rita Greengrove. The crossword questions that the man is doing, the answers seem to relate to Earl's life. Question 1A, six letters, the thing you feel most often. Answer for Earl, regret. Question 4D, four letters, your wife, who lately seems to have developed a preoccupation with the recreational activities of the contractors she hired. Her name, answer, Rita. We see some young men are doing some work in Earl and Rita's backyard. They are building them a guest house. Rita, the wife, is convinced that the workers are smoking marijuana cigarettes. She calls them deadbeats, and she tells her husband and then that this is going on. Earl tells Rita, who cares, Rita? Rita replies, I care. I'm paying those bozos to build the guest house. Earl tells his wife, we don't need a guest house, we never have any guests. Rita argues back to her husband, well we would if you took your nose out of those godforsaken puzzles and finally made a couple of friends. Rita then turns her attention back to the workers and she says, look at them, one of them's shirtless, what is this, Italy? Crossword question 7A, seven letters, the thing you're best at. The thing your father and his father before him were best at. Answer, leaving, or maybe bolting, bailing, or running. Earl, he goes for a walk to a nearby variety store. Rick, the ice cream man, seems to be working there today. Earl asks, where's Mac, the normal guy that works here? And Rick says that he's filling in today. Back at the house, Earl's wife, Rita, confronts the young people working on their guest house. Rita tells the one worker, you should put your shirt back on. There's kids in this neighborhood. The shirtless worker is confused. Rita explains, your shirt. This isn't a beach, you know. The guy says, oh, uh, he's sorry. He's just hot as all. As Rita turns around to head back inside the house, she thinks she hears one of the workers saying, you miserable fucking bitch. We ought to eat your fucking face off. When Rita turns around, she asks, What did you say? And the worker replies, I just said my bad, Miss G. The shirt won't happen again. So did Rita imagine the worker saying that? Or is Rick the ice cream man influencing her and making her hear things? Hard to say. Earl, he is sitting at a park, continuing to do a crossword, silently to himself. Earl, he starts hearing a voice in his head. Hello, Earl. Work the words to your fingertips. Figure out the letters. Solve the puzzle, Earl. Earl asks, who's there? Whose voice is that? The crossword, question 18A, nine letters. The way your child was brought into this world about 30 years ago now. What was her name, Earl? Answer was Agatha. The voice continues, conquer the white space. Fill out the grid. Back at the house, Rita imagines that the workers are now preparing to kill her. 
The still, shirtless worker says, We're coming for you, Granny. Rita, she gets scared. She tries to phone the police, but the voice on the phone says to her, You were wrong, Miss G. It wasn't weed we were smoking. It was meth and black tar heroin. The three of us are so messed up. I'm gonna take my shirt off and come make a meal of you. Hope that's cool with you, Miss G. Rita hangs up the phone and she locks the door. She wonders where her husband, Earl, is. Earl, he is still being tormented by the voice in his head and he is still continuing to do the crossword puzzle. Question 33D. Five letters. How you feel all of the time, even in a crowd of people. How you'll likely die when all is said and done. Answer, alone. Question 41A. Three letters. Your colleague, your best friend, the man that Rita sleeps with when you're away on business. You've always known, but never said anything. Answer, Ted. Earl, he starts losing it. He starts imagining himself falling through the crossword puzzle. Back at the house, the young workers have apparently broken in and are coming after Rita. Rita has barricaded herself in the bedroom and grabs Earl's handgun. Back to the crossword. Question 48 D. 12 letters. What you should do. The only way out of your tiny little life. Answer. Kill yourself. The ice cream man's influence seems to be trying to influence Earl and Rita to go crazy and do harm to themselves. Earl decides that he will not kill himself, though. He yells at the voice. That ain't the way, you hear me? Rita needs me, and I need her. Four letters, where I belong, where me and Rita kiss every Christmas under the living room mistletoe. There's no place like it. Answer, home. Earl, he returns home, and he walks into his bedroom door, and Rita shoots the gun, thinking it is the young workers. Luckily, she missed Earl, and both of them are alive and okay. The two of them embrace. They say that they are sorry. Earl tells his wife that he's been getting it all wrong. He says, no more distractions, no more wasting time with puzzles and papers and all that crap. You're my wife for Christ's sake. The two, they hug, and Earl, he sends the workers building the guest house home. He tells them that they are going to be canceling the building of the guest house and that he is sorry to take work away from you boys. Him and his wife, they might even go on a little vacation. The worker replies, don't sweat it, Mr. G. Traveling is lit. Lit. Earl thinks about that word, lit. A narration box reads, That's another insidious thing about words, right? You finally start to feel like you got the right ones, and then suddenly you don't. The board clears. The grid is empty. The puzzle begins anew. Good luck trying to figure it all out. And then we see the young workers drive away. And that is the end of the issue. Issue 15, Coat Check Story. There is a girl named Lillian. She is in some sort of insane asylum. She seems to be very zonked out and out of it. She keeps talking about how she took someone else's coat and how it all went sideways. We have a flashback now. We see Lillian at a restaurant. She was on a date with a guy and she was treating him kind of bad, saying his conversation was banal and boring, and he is making her labia dry. The guy comments, Christ, what is wrong with you? You're a real pill, you know that? Lillian, she leaves and she says, I'm well aware, thanks for the dinner, pal. As Lillian goes to grab her coat from the coat check, Rick, the ice cream man, appears to be working there. He gives her a nice green coat. Lillian comments, this isn't my jacket. But Rick tells her it's the only jacket back here. And Lillian decides why not keep it anyway. It's a pretty sweet coat after all. Lillian is then walking outside in this new green coat. And she sees a creepy kid with a balloon. Balloon boy tells her that there's a finger in her pocket. Lillian tells the kid that he's mistaken. But then she reaches into her coat pocket and she finds a severed finger, which is indeed weird. She asks the kid, how did he know? But Balloon Boy has already disappeared. 
Lillian then goes to her girlfriend Vera's house, and the two of them get it on. But during their lovemaking, Lillian gets all weirded out when Vera appears to be wearing a mask, and then she bites her, and then Balloon Boy appears in the bedroom and tells Lillian, You shouldn't wear someone else's jacket, Lillian. Lillian, she wakes up. Apparently, she was just dreaming. She says bye to her girlfriend, Vera. Lillian, she then goes over to her mother's home. Lillian's mother is very sick and mentally ill and requires a lot of care. Lillian gives her mom a sponge bath. Her mom is kind of out of it. After the sponge bath, Lillian looks at her mom's mail. Her mom seems to be falling behind on various bills. Lillian's mom tells her, The boy with the balloon said he'd take care of everything. Lillian is freaked out and she asks, Boy with the balloon? The mom continues, Oh, sweet little scamp. I gave him $3.26 to help deal with the dead bird problem. Lillian asks, You don't have a dead bird problem, Ma. What boy? Did the nurses let him in? Her mom answers, We played games. He said to count my fingers from 1 to 10, but I only ever got to 9. Isn't that funny? Later on, Lillian is talking to her therapist about all this weird shit she's been seeing lately and how it all started when she took some other person's coat. Lillian says there was a, a finger in the pocket and this balloon boy, he keeps popping up wherever I go. And then my mom, Lillian's therapist, tells her, look, if the big bad coat is the root of all your current problems, then why not just get rid of it? So Lillian decides to do that. She returns to the restaurant and attempts to give the coat back to the coat check person there, who's a woman now and not Rick. She tells the coat check girl, it's not my coat, I want you to take it. The coat check woman asks, why do you have a jacket that isn't yours? And Lillian yells back, because you assholes gave it to me. Lillian, she then leaves the restaurant without her jacket. She is walking down the street. It's pretty cold out though. Lillian, she sees a dead bird on the sidewalk and Balloon Boy is there again and he says, I can help with the dead bird problem. Hey, aren't you cold? Lillian, she's freaked out now. She tells Balloon Boy, God damn it, kid, leave me alone. You're not real. Lillian, she starts running. She runs down the subway stairs and then she starts muttering to herself. You're not crazy, Lillian. You're not your mom. Lillian, she sees tons of versions of herself wearing the green coat and they welcome her and they give her a coat and they tell her a flower needs its pretty petals. A queen must be dressed to match her glory. They give her a box and say, your scepter, my queen. Lillian opens the box and inside is a severed finger. Then she stares at her own fingers and she appears to be missing one and she screams, no! Balloon Boy, he appears once again and says, I guess it was your coat after all. It's so hard to keep stuff straight. Balloon Boy tells Lillian to come sit. He points her to a wheelchair and tells her, your throne awaits. Sit and be the queen of lilies. After that, we don't know exactly what happened, but Lillian wound up in a mental institution that we saw her in at the beginning of the issue. At the institution, we see Lillian's psychiatrist checked in on her, and then she eventually leaves. The psychiatrist returns to her car, and she comments to herself, Poor little Lily. In the back seat of the psychiatrist's car, we see Balloon Boy, Rick the Ice Cream Man, and Lillian's mom. They are all back there. And Rick, he says, you know what they say, thistles must be cut down before they flower. And the psychiatrist, she then drives away. So once again, we see another story of Rick making someone descend into madness. Issue 16, Tiny Lives. This issue is also the name of the overall trade paperback for Volume 4, so it is, in many ways, the strongest story of the four. In the suburbs, we see a father named Mitch. Mitch is a single father, raising a teenage daughter named Jen. As Mitch is cleaning his daughter's bedroom, he comes across a bra. His 
daughter is growing up, becoming a woman. Mitch then comes across his daughter's diary. It reads, Jen's journal, private. Private in big letters. Mitch knows that he shouldn't read his daughter's diary. He should respect her privacy. But he eventually decides to read it anyway. And in the diary, Jen, she writes about getting her period and also having to read Pride and Prejudice in school, and she's not really into the book. But then she talks about a boy she likes, and she says, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I want my first time to be with Derek. There's just something about his face that makes me want to jump on him and do it. So I picked up you-know-whats from the store. I want to be ready when the time comes, fingers crossed. Mood bored, crabby, excited, nervous. Mitch. He is concerned. His 17-year-old daughter, Jen, appears to be already having sex at her young age. Mitch, he goes downstairs and he talks with his daughter, Jen. He asks her, should we be having the birds and bees type talk? I mean, you're 17 now. And Jen replies, you're joking, right, Dad? And Mitch replies, I just want to make sure I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do. I'm checking all the boxes. Jen tells her dad that he's sweet and He's doing a great job as a single parent, but he doesn't have to worry about her. Later on, Mitch goes to some sort of support group for single fathers that he is a part of. Mitch, he talks to the group about reading his daughter's diary. The group seems to look down upon this action, saying it wasn't a good move. Mitch says that he knows, but she's starting to, you know, be with boys. How... How do I warn her that sex complicates everything, that sometimes the reward isn't worth the risk? The leader of the group tells Mitch, You tell her just like you told me. You're her father, Mitch. You know what the right thing to do is. Later on, Mitch is at home, and he ends up reading more of his daughter's diary. This is what the newest entry says. Oh my god, Derek was everything I dreamed he would be. The look on his face, he was so nervous and scared. And when it was over, everything was so still, it was perfect. I think I might be a little obsessed. Maybe I'll try Ryan next. He's kind of a dweeb, but I don't want to limit myself, you know. After Ryan, maybe Dave, and then Chad. If I can convince him to skip Math League for once. I bought more you-know-whats for all the fun I'm going to have. I don't think I've ever felt this free. It's like a small voice in my head keeps saying, Live. Mood board. Turned on. Happy. Addicted. Mitch, he is really worried now after reading this. It seems like his daughter is really getting around. Later that night, Mitch is watching the ice cream man on TV. And Jen, she comes downstairs. And she says that she is going out with Ryan tonight. Mitch asks, what happened to Derek? And Jen says, that piece of shit is dead to me now. Mitch tells his daughter that he wants her to be safe. He asks her if she is using protection. And she says, of course she is. She is safer than safe. The next day, Mitch talks to one of the dads in his support group. From the conversation, the other dad starts making Mitch feel better. He tells Mitch that he shouldn't be reading his daughter's diary, but he's doing the best job he can and... Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Mitch, he goes home, and he reads his daughter's diary again. And in the latest entry, Jen wrote, I can't stop killing people. I wake up and a little angel whispers in my ear, someone else has to die. And so I go out and I do it again and again. It's so much fun, it almost makes me sick. First, it was Derek, doofy little Derek with his cleft chin and slight lisp. I made little incisions in the ends of his fingers like paper cuts until he ran out of blood to bleed. Then it was Ryan. He sobbed and begged and admitted he was in love with his own sister. What a creep! He ran out of blood too. Then Troy and then Dave. All of these losers with their dumb brains and their horny little dicks. They're all so sure of themselves, but every time the blade goes through their skin and the blood starts pouring out, and I can see how small they actually are. Like slimy little bugs under my shoes. Tonight I'm going out with Sean. Dude bangs on some cymbals for a week and considers himself a musician. It's so sad and pathetic. 
I wonder how long he'll bleed before the light in his eyes goes out. That's all for now. I am young and the world is beautiful. Moodboard, hungry for blood. Mitch, reading this, breathes a sign of relief. His daughter is not a slut, she's just murdering people. <laughs> no, no, I joke, I kid. Mitch is actually very concerned about what his daughter is doing. In his daughter's room, he sees a box, and it is labeled, You Know What? And inside the box is a whole bunch of bloody knives. Later that night, Jen, she goes to leave again. She has another date, this one with Sean. Mitch follows his daughter that night, and after the movie, Jen leads Sean down a dark alleyway, and Jen stabs Sean in his stomach. Mitch, he then goes down the alleyway, and he finds and confronts his daughter, Jen, holding a bloody knife and surprised asks, Dad, what are you doing here? And Mitch asks his daughter, what am I doing here? What am I doing here, Jen? You're a murderer. Sean, who is still alive but bleeding out, says, I just texted my dad. The cops are on their way. You're toast. Mitch, he then jumps into action to protect his daughter. The cops are going to be here soon. His daughter will be found to be a murderer. Mitch tells Sean, I really wish you hadn't done that, son. Mitch, he then finishes off Sean with a knife, killing him. Mitch then tells his daughter to go home. She was never here. He is going to take the blame for this. They hug, they both cry, and Jen, she eventually goes home, and Mitch, he gets arrested and goes to jail. Two years go by. Jen is now in university. Jen is talking to a boy that is there, and she tells the boy that her dad is in jail, death row. The boy comments, whoa, heavy. Hey, uh, if you want to take your mind off it, the frat I'm pledging is having a party tonight. No cover for pretty girls. Jen smiles and says that she'll think about it. This leads me to believe that maybe Jen is still killing unsuspecting men. We don't know for sure, though. As the boy leaves, Jen opens a letter that is from her dad. From Mitch in prison. In the letter, Mitch tells his daughter... Only a few more days until they fry me alive. Execution by electrocution. Mitch, he writes a little bit more, and then he eventually ends his letter by saying, It might be the end of the road for me, but remember, you've got infinity. You can fold the world to your will like it's nothing but a glob of silly potty. Stretch it. Knead it. It's endless. Make it the exact shape you want. Whatever shape that is, it's already perfect. It's pre-approved. You are young and life is beautiful. I'm ready now. Love, Dad. And after that heartwarming story, we end Ice Cream Man Volume 4. Alright, so that was Ice Cream Man Volumes 3 and 4. Let me go through my thoughts on this one. Uh, the only issues I really liked a lot in these two volumes were Issue 11, the TV story one, that is the one with all the reality TV show parodies, like the Kardashians and Zombies and the Bachelor parody, but they're all mannequins. I love the weirdness of it and making fun of all these reality TV shows and how creepy and random it was. I had a lot of fun going through that one, so that was great. I also liked issue 16, Tiny Lives, where we have this teenage daughter and the father's reading her diary and thinks that she is banging all of these boys, but it turns out she's just killing them, and then he takes the blame for her. So I thought that was uh, a pretty fun one as well. The rest of them, I'm kind of mixed on, okay? So let me go through the rest of them. Issue 9, Western Story. That is the one where we have Rick and Caleb in this Western town, but they kind of look like aliens or something. Their eyes are all black and their ears are weird. And we meet their uncle, and their uncle sort of tells them the truth to the universe. Rick, he kills the uncle, and then he escapes to another universe, and Caleb, I guess, is going to go after him. So I thought it was really cool to learn more of the kind of lore of the overall deal between Rick and Caleb, but I also left that issue more confused than I was before, too. <laughs> issue 10, Border Story. I was annoyed by the Spanish. I would have liked if they just translated it for us, but whatever, I guess it was kind of unique. 
Um, and then we have Rick as this general marrying this 15-year-old, and uh, Rick kills her lover, and then Maria, the girl, escapes and goes to be with the man in black for safety. Kind of a random story, but kind of fun as well and unique. Uh, issue 12, the space story one. It was fun to have a sci-fi kind of ice cream man story and traveling through space. That was pretty cool. And then once that astronaut is on this moon, he sees a creepy ice cream man, Rick, there. And Rick steals his spaceship and flies away. And Caleb, I guess, is going to go after him. So interesting stuff there, although I'm still a little confused on how everything is all going to work. Issue 13, Palindromes. I uh, thought the gimmick of reading the story forward and backwards was cool, but honestly, terrible story. Let's be honest. That was a terrible story, and uh, I'm not a huge fan of it. So the gimmick's cool, but I didn't really like it. Issue 14, Down and Across. That was kind of typical Ice Cream Man creepiness, uh, seeing this couple and them sort of being influenced by Rick and going down this rabbit hole of insanity. The guy answering these cross uh, words was, was cool. So, yeah, it was an all right one, but maybe not exceptional. Uh, issue 15, Kochek story. Another issue of someone descending into madness. It was all right. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm kind of mixed on a lot of these issues, but I am really still intrigued in this book, and I want to see where it's going to go from here. I'm going to give this one a 7.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. And I'll be back next week with more comics.